It's one thing for you to know Christ, but it's another thing for you to be in Christ. It is a blessing to believe in Christ, but it is a bigger blessing for you to be in Christ. The book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and I want us to read verses 17. My Bible reads, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Three things that I want us to focus and to look into, and I take you deeper. The first thing there, it's very important, is uh, if any man be in Christ. This now says everyone is invited. It does not matter your skin color. It does not matter your gender. It does not matter your background. It does not matter your language. If any man be in Christ, that's the first thing that I want you to pay attention to. The second thing that I want you to pay attention to is old things are passed away. Meaning by the reason of you being in Christ, old things are passed away. I've had people talk about, uh, and I've also ministered about it, uh, generational cases for an example. Things that stopped your mother stopping you. Things that stopped your grandmother stopping you. Things that fought your father fighting you. Now, the Bible says, by being in Christ, old things are passed away. And believe it or not, brothers and sisters, that includes generational curses. Because Christ himself is the seed of Abraham. And as being in Christ, we are now direct partakers of the blessing and uh, the promises that God had put on uh, Father Abraham. So that means uh, by being in Christ, uh, old things are passed away. Not just my sins, but also what stopped my family. Generational cases. Now watch this. The third thing, which is the most important thing, is the word behold. I need to go deeper here before I take you higher. You see the word behold. I'm sure you have seen it many times in your Bible. The word behold there does not mean the same thing like other beholds in the Bible. When you read, for an example, the book of Ezekiel chapter 37, as we all know, when I, uh, Ezekiel prophesied to the dry bones, the Bible says, as he prophesied as he was commanded, behold, there was noise in the valley. The word behold there in the book of Ezekiel, it simple means uh, take a closer look because something unusual is about to happen. But as for this one, it means awaken to a reality. So when the Bible says, behold, all things are become new, it's saying awaken to a reality, all things are become new. Meaning all things are become new, you have received a new beginning as soon as you awaken to a reality. New life is on the other side of behold. New life is on the other side of uh, awakening to a reality. No wonder why you will hear people say things like, Men of God, I've been in church and I've been churching all the time, but my life is not making sense. I love God. I love Jesus. I'm in Christ. And they are convinced that they are in Christ. But men of God, how come my life is not making sense? It's because it is possible for you to be in Christ, go to church, and church all the time, yet you have not awakened to a reality. And one of the things that causes people not to awaken to the reality that Paul is talking about in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, is uh, wrong teachings or the revelation of Christ that they have. Because at the end of the day, the revelation of Christ that you have will determine how far you can go. You will never know God more than the revelation of God that you have. You will never know Christ beyond the revelation that you have about Christ. So at the end of the day, what you know about Christ and the revelation that you have about Christ determines how far you will go and the results in your life. Now, let me take you deeper. 
because I'm about to take you higher. It says, if any man be in Christ, brothers and sisters, it does not say if any man believe in Christ. It does not say if any man accepts Christ. It says, if any man be in Christ. And believe it or not, Christ here is more than just uh, his personality. But Christ here is his position and also his power. So Christ here is a place, brothers and sisters. Let me mirror this to something quickly. It is in the book of uh, Ephesians chapter 2. And of course, I will read verses 6. King James. It says, uh, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So Jesus is more than just uh, you believing uh, uh, in him. But there is Christ in Jesus. I don't know if uh, maybe somebody is getting what I'm trying to say here. No wonder why when he asked the disciples and he said, who do you say I am? And when Simon answered and said, thou art Christ, Jesus looked at Simon and said, flesh and blood did not reveal this unto you, but my father in heaven. Because you can know Jesus, but uh, it's another thing to know Christ. To know Christ, it has to be a revelation. One must awaken to a certain reality. So Christ is a place. No wonder why the book of Hebrews will put it this way. Chapter 12, it says, uh, we are come unto Mount Zion. Brothers and sisters, we are not going to Mount Zion. I want you to understand that. You know, I've heard people singing, we are marching to Zion. That's good. That sounds good. But as a believer who has awakened to a reality, you are not marching to Zion. You are not going to Zion. You are in Zion. For the Bible says, you are come. You are not coming. You are come. Meaning as I'm ministering to you right now, as long as you are in Christ, you are in Zion. But what is Zion? Scripture declares uh, a city of the living God, a heavenly Jerusalem, a place of innumerable number of angels. That is where now you are by being in Christ. So Christ is a place. No wonder why Paul will put it this way. He says, in him I walk. In him I live. In him I have my being. You see, the book of uh, uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, it says, as he is, so am I. As he is, so are we. So if Christ is the city that we are talking about, uh, it means we are also a city. And Christ himself said it. He said, you are a city upon a hill. Another vision says, you are a city on a hill. And that is because he is the city. No wonder why Jesus said he is the light of the world and he turned and he looked at us and he said, you are the light of the world. And that is because as he is, so am I. So whatever you cannot find in Jesus, it is illegal for you to find it in me. If Jesus himself cannot be sick, it means I cannot be sick. I might feel sick, but I'm not allowed to say I am sick. Let's, let me show you something in your Bible, because one will be like, what, what is this man of God to, talking about today? The book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 33, and I will read verse 24. Look at what your Bible says. Mine says, And kula bahaya, the inhabitant of Zion, shall not say, I am sick. Hebrews 12. But ye are come unto Mount Zion. But ye are come unto Mount Zion. And those who are in Zion shall not say, I am sick. You are not going to Zion. By being in Christ, you are in Zion. You are not visiting Zion. You are in Zion. And scripture says, those who are in Zion shall not say, I am sick. Let's continue. It says, but ye are come, kula bahanda, unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, 
and to an innumerable company of angels. You are come, you are right there. You see, once you awaken to a reality that you are not going there, you are not in Christ to leave Christ, to come back to Christ, but you are in Christ to be in Christ until the end of time. You begin to operate with different sets of rules. Do you know that the enemy attacks you based on the revelation you have? He will look at the revelation you have and he will attack you using the revelation you have. I always told church people, and I will tell you today, that the enemy is not scared of the presence of God. And once that registers in your spirit, you will change the way you operate. The enemy is not scared of the presence of God. Whoever told you that the devil, Satan, is scared of God's presence, they lied to you. As a matter of fact, Satan loves God's presence. When you read your Bible, you realize that Jesus is fasting 40 days, 40 nights. Scripture declares that on the last day of the fasting, there came the devil. I thought by this time, the devil will not come closer to Jesus. Because number one, Jesus just got baptized. Number two, Jesus just received the Holy Ghost. Number three, a voice spoke from the heavens. This is my son. I thought the devil would play far from Jesus because God declared Jesus his son. So if the devil has to play around, he must not play around Jesus. And on top of that, Jesus is in fasting. I thought fasting will cause him to burn. But instead, we see the devil showing up in the book of Matthew chapter 4. And he's talking to Jesus like nothing is happening. If you are a son of God, turn this stone to become bread. And immediately, Jesus goes to Deuteronomy and he says, Man shall not live by bread alone. But man can also live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And when the devil heard that, instead of him leaving Jesus, he goes to the scripture. He begins to preach to Jesus that if Jesus will throw himself down, scripture in the book of Psalms declares that God will not allow him to break any of his bones. He will send angels to protect him. Imagine this is Jesus and the devil is not saying I'm burning. Come on now. The devil is not saying there is fire here. But the devil is comfortable to an extent that he went as far as preaching the word to Jesus. Who is Jesus? John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. And the word was God. And verse 14 says, and the word became flesh. So Jesus is the word. Imagine if the devil, Brother Brian, will preach the word to the word. And he did not feel like I'm burning anything like that like you are told. That's why you hardly see demons manifesting outside. They know there is God in the church. They know there is God in that place. But they will still go with the person that they have possessed. Why these demons, don't they jump out and wait for the person to come out of church if they were scared of the presence of God? Rather, we cast them out in the presence of God because from the first place, they were not scared. One will say, but Apostle, we know you are a student of the scripture, but we know as well, we understand humanistic scripture, interpret scripture. What other scripture can you use to back up your argument? Simple. The Bible says in the book of Job, Job chapter 1, and there was a meeting in heaven where the sons of God, angels here, were meant or were supposed to present themselves before God. And Satan was amongst them. And God noticed Satan and said, Satan, where are you coming from? The devil said, I've been up and down. And God said to him, have you seen my servant Job? Imagine right in the presence of God, Satan was there. Other angels are there to present gifts before God. And guess what? Satan is there. Why is Satan not saying, I am burning? You see, it means uh, somewhere, somehow, we have been taught wrong. He is not scared of the presence of God. Let me show you one more scripture. The Bible says, uh, and uh, Jesus looked at Peter and said, get thee behind me, Satan. Meaning Satan had entered Peter to speak to Jesus. 
But because Jesus had a discerning spirit, knew and had a prophetic spirit that this is not Peter talking, but this is Satan. Therefore, get thee behind me, Satan. And not only that, Jesus looked at his disciples and said, one of you, the devil will enter him. And the Bible says, and Satan entered Judas Iscariot. Why? Because Satan is never scared of the presence of God. And let me give you this one. This one will kill everything. The Bible says, and Jesus came to Peter. I feel like preaching in this place. And Jesus came to Peter and said, Peter, Satan asked for you, but I prayed for you. Where did the devil ask for Peter? Meaning the devil went to God and said, I'm asking for Peter. He's not scared. But what pushes the devil away? I'm not saying the presence of God is not powerful. He is not scared of the presence of God. He is scared of what the presence of God can do to you. Did you hear that? He is scared of what the presence of God can do to you. So what moves the enemy is revelation. Once you have a revelation that I'm in Christ, Munda Kabraska Tahibaha, Malendre Bahuska Vahaya, help me, Holy Spirit. I'm in Christ here. I am no longer who I used to be. In my blood. Yes, I have my father's blood. I have my mother's blood. But guess what? I have God's DNA. Because I'm born of the word. Once you know that I'm in Christ, then everything around me has changed. You see, I always say this to my children. And I always teach them. And I always say to them, it doesn't matter what it is. Any animal will give birth after its own kind. A lion will produce a lion. A giraffe will produce a giraffe. And if I am born of God, in, it means God produced me. So if I'm produced of God, it means I have not just the spirit of God, but I have the fullness of God in me. Not parts of God, but the fullness of God in me. So by being in Christ and I'm awakened to that reality, what reality is that? The reality is that the word of God is active and is alive in me. So when I speak, the words I speak are spirit and they are life. So when I say something, it is not just me saying it, but there is a part of God in me that is saying what I'm saying. You see, uh, most Christians don't understand that it is more than singing. It is more than worshiping. It is more than believing. It's about dominion. It's about establishing God's kingdom on earth. It's about God himself finding a bridge to push his agenda, to establish his kingdom. And guess what? He does it through us, his children. But as long as you are not awakened to a reality, you will be asking for things that you should be commanding. It, is, it will be ignorance of my son or my children, or all my three children, to start coming to me every morning, asking for breakfast. No, everything is already there. Go make breakfast. Go get some food. But it will be crazy for a stranger to come, and I wake up in my, in my house, and a stranger is busy eating on my table. I'll be shocked. I'll call the police. But as for my children, nothing surprising about that. There is nothing shocking about it. Because what's mine is theirs. So there are people who are in Christ, but are still asking for things that are, they are not supposed to be asking for. It is in the awakening that you begin to realize that there are things that as long as you are asking for them, they will never materialize. Do you know that there are things today that you are asking God for that have left God's hand the day you said yes to Christ? When you said yes to Christ and you were in Christ, whatever that God himself gives to those that are in Christ left God's hand. No wonder why Apostle Peter says, we have been blessed with all kinds of blessings. With all kinds of blessings. And then he tells you where? He says in the heavenly places. Meaning one has to be spiritual to perform the blessing. One has to have a certain level of understanding 
to fathom and materialize the blessing. Gone are those days for you to live an ordinary life. Gone are those days for you to be attacked and affected by things that were never supposed to and never meant to affect you from the first place. I refuse on your behalf. Say wherever you are. Say after me, I refuse. Say, I refuse to be poor. I refuse to be broke. I refuse to be sick. I refuse to be a beggar. I refuse to be a borrower. Why? Because the Bible tells you a borrower is a slave to the lender. Praise the Lord, everybody. It tells you that you shall borrow from none, but you shall be a lender. You shall lend to many. There is an anointing on you by being in Christ. I'm not talking about an anointing to preach. Because the word anointing means an ability to do something. So by being in Christ, since Christ means a place, an anointed place, the anointed one, there is an anointing that you have received, an anointing to produce what your mother could not produce because your mother was not in Christ. There is an anointing to produce results that your father could not produce because your father did not know what you know. And that is a revelation of being in Christ. It is more than just kneeling down and praying, hoping that an angel will be sent for your rescue. The Bible says, don't you know, that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Brothers and sisters, you are a God's living tabernacle. That when you move, you are, you, are, you are a carrier of God's presence. There is more than what you think in you. He says, ye are God. That's what the Bible says. But because you know not, you die like mere men. As for me, I refuse to die like a mere man. I know who I am. I know who I is in Christ Jesus. And my children will know that. There is more into this than just waiting for an angel. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, angels are ministering spirits sent to minister to those who have inherited salvation. And who are those? You and I. We don't pray to angels. We command angels. Hi, yeah, yeah. Ay, ay, ay. They are ministering spirits. Once you are awakened to this reality, because it says, if any man be in Christ, and you understand Christ as being a place, and what place is that Zion? And what is Zion? A city of the living God. A heavenly Jerusalem. A place of innumerable number of angels. So where I am, I'm surrounded by angels. On my left, angels. On my right, angels. Ahead of me, angels. Behind me, angels. Beneath me, angels. Everywhere. Some of you, you are in Christ, like you say. But every time you're about to sleep, you are more conscious of witches and demons that are around you. But I double dare you today to change the revelation that you have. Instead of worrying about demons pulling you, start thinking about angels coming to bless you, coming to proclaim, coming to minister to you. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new.